So uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the new features that we're launching today. We've got a lot of exciting announcements. And um, we're going to be follow that up with some of the foundational elements that forms the, uh, the, the AI uh, layer that, uh, that is responsible for launching all these new features and capabilities. Then we have a demo, which Alex is going to be uh, walking us through, followed by an exciting panel discussion as well. You know, Galaxy not too far away, where code is the force, and DevWalker is on a quest. Let's take a look at what happens. Galaxy of Infinite Code. A young DevWalker is at the brink of a new software journey. His potential obscured by doubts. Codes fraught with bugs. In the shadows of the cloud, costs surge. Deployments going haywire. From a distant bite, Devmaster Ada emerges to his aid. Simplified, we will. Harnessing the code. Vanquishing the bugs. Cyber attack. Shielding the software. Savings light the way, enriching our treasury. Deploy, we will, into the cloud galaxy. Right, so this awesome video was created by uh, Panyan using AI, again, a combination of uh, uh, stable diffusion, uh, 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 Pixabay, and so on. So uh, the way we think about AI is really as augmented intelligence. Like, how do you sort of enhance human capabilities, and how do you augment that with, with, uh, with all the capabilities and that AI has to offer? Um, is kind of how we look at it. Not really as a replacement uh, of, uh, of humans, but as augmenting their intelligence. On one, one end of the spectrum, you have uh, humans sort of using it to extract value through intelligent prompts. The outputs are, are, are as good as the inputs. The, on the other side of the spectrum, you have these AI systems that are working on a constant reinforcement learning based human feedback loop in order to get better and better over time. And the ultimate objective of all of this really is to enhance creativity, enhance productivity, and reduce the toil that nobody wants to do. So when you think about, there's a lot happening in the space, in, this, in the AI landscape. But when you think about it, if you were to look at it across these three different dimensions, from a tech stack standpoint, there's a combination of language models, um, data sets, and AI uh, uh, APIs that are essentially powering a lot of the foundational aspects of launching these features and capabilities. And from an operating model standpoint, you can see that in, if you've, uh, from this morning, you heard uh, from Jyoti and Brad about launching Gitness with AI being at the forefront. That's kind of how we're thinking about it for all of the existing capabilities and new features that we develop. And we see the same from our customers as well. Now, for this to happen and for this to be successful, we want this infusion to, to occur not just from a, from a technology standpoint, but also from a, team, from a team and a collaboration standpoint. So a lot of the, the, the AI uh, 
machine learning and data scientists are collaborating very closely with our, with our engineering teams in order to bring these features and capabilities to the fore. Uh, from a developer standpoint, the roles are getting elevated from focusing more on the, from the syntactic layer to a semantic layer and understanding the meaning and, and really leveraging the systems. Uh, from an operational standpoint, they're looking at not just deployment of applications and services um, and the reliability of, uh, of these services, but, but also for, for machine learning models and versioning them and managing them over time. Uh, so we see these operating models also uh, that are uh, evolving uh, from um, managing from, from working at a very deep, deep level to elevating to understand what is happening at, at different layers of abstraction in order to extract value. And lastly, a lot of the tools, a lot of the AI tools are being reimagined. So think of documentation, think of um, uh, code generation um, uh, uh, or uh, support. A lot of the tools are being thought of from an AI first standpoint. And that's, that's kind of how we are looking at it as well. <coughs> So as uh, Jyoti mentioned earlier this uh, earlier today, we have a long history of uh, launching um, a lot of AI f features, uh, which goes back to the days of using CV, continuous verification, to understand the impact of builds. Um, we, we also launched uh, continuous integration along with test intelligence, which helps one selectively uh, pick um, tests in order to reduce the overall build times. And more recently, earlier this year, we announced three capabilities to troubleshoot and fix build errors, to fix uh, uh, security uh, issues and remediate them in real time, and finally, for uh, in order to manage the, the, the cloud assets, uh, provide developers the ability to use natural language input and author policies. I'm super excited to be announcing uh, seven more capabilities today, thanks to the hard work from all of our engineering teams across all the different modules at Harness, uh, starting with uh, Semant uh, starting with Gitness, that is, that is uh, powered by semantic search, where the search is elevated from being at the keyword level to being at, to, to being at more contextual level. For, for, uh, we also want to make our onboarding experience extremely streamlined. Um, so we're launching the ability to onboard feature flags to, uh, by automatically generating installation code and authentication code. Uh, based on the kind of language frameworks and formats that, that the user select. Uh, we, we have a customer support assistant that is going to be um, uh, part of the Harness platform. So if you have any questions, if you have any uh, is uh, uh, issues related to uh, using Harness, then we want to make that easy for you to access within the platform itself. Uh, so it, it's going to crawl through your documentation and, and knowledge base in order to come back with, uh, with answers. <coughs> Um, the, the CD module has a couple of really exciting announcements as well. The, uh, the CD error analyzer to understand the deployment errors and, uh, and uh, fix them for, from, a, from a pipeline standpoint. And the second uh, feature for OPA policy generator is one of the most exciting and uh, uh, requested uh, demos for our, from our customers. Uh, who wants to deal with complex Rego syntax when you can just author policies, have natural language input, and, and, and get the uh, OPA policies to be able to govern your pipelines? Uh, Chaos uh, uh, Guard, which is a, a mechanism, again, to use natural language input to uh, help authors uh, or to help users to make sure that chaos faults are not targeted towards the wrong infrastructure. And finally, we have the, uh, we're, we're also announcing the ability to automatically generate dashboards based on human input. So you can essentially come up with, uh, uh, come up with insights and have like nat natural human interaction to be able to generate these, uh, these dashboards. Now, for all of this to, to come to fruition, we need to build a pretty robust foundational uh, layer. And uh, Panyan is going to talk about how, we wanna, how we're going to re realize this vision and uh, what are the investments we're, we're making in the space. Yeah, thanks, Harish. Thanks for the introduction. As Harish said, today I'm just going to talk about how we've been thinking to integrate this generative AI technology to our product seamlessly and also delivering value. So we have, we, let's just look at this foundation or this framework that we've set up. We have this like a very base layer, which is our generative AI layers that has both like a third party providers, LLMs, and also like in-house LLMs that we have that we train it internally and self-hosting it. 
So we thought that if we take this like hybrid approach, we can access both of the best words with this like a public LLMs, like a GPT-4, like a GPT models or Google models. They're pretty good at like generalizing to various tasks and they have this vast amount of like a general knowledge, but they might not be the best for your specific use cases. And that's why we think that we should have our own LLMs and also hosted and train it on our domain specific knowledge and data. And then in the middle, we have our like, generative AI common service. This is like a layer for centralizing the, the whole like, streamlining the processing and like, credential management and also doing like a pre and post processing. This is basically like a standard interface for all of our harness modules to interact with different LLMs. It also like is going to support different capabilities for using this LLMs like RAG or like a retrieval augmented generation, basically something like a semantic search if we want to do as like providing more context for this LLMs and integrated with some sort of like a retrieval system using our vector DBs from our data layer. And then on the top, we have all our harness modules. That's where the user can also interact through our AI, sorry, through our UI. And like those modules are going to source their data from our different databases, from data layer, do the first level of like processing, then forward it to our Gen AI service to be handled based on like a different tasks. And then on a left, you see the, this layer like alongside the whole like a framework that we have that's going to have like a security monitoring and cost management which we think that it should be integrated to all of these layers that we have security because of the sensitivity of the data and also importance of like a privacy we think having like this robust like a security layer as like crucial and it's just going to do some like a credential management and also access control doing some security audits regularly to kind of like ensure that we are providing our system from potential threats or breaches and also monitoring we want to constantly monitor our data analyze it and just make sure that all the health metrics are still healthy and of course cost management to keep an eye on a cost make sure that we have like a efficient resource utilization and we can relate it back to our business metrics if needed. So as Harish mentioned, I also showed, we also trying and we're thinking to train our own LLMs or kind of owning our own language model. But the question is why do you even bother train your own like LLM or just like a self-hosted? So we think that there are three advantages. These are like the most important one that we can benefit from if we have our own LLMs. The first one is cost. Any of this like a third party provider public models are just going to rely on some external server which comes with their own kind of like a pricing model and it can get really expensive as we grow. And they also have some latency usage limits and some of them are pretty slow for our use cases and they're not like scalable at all. So having our own LLMs and hosting it ourselves, then we can make sure that everything is just going to be super fast, cost effective, and we can scale it up as needed. Then we also think about accuracy. As I said, like all of these public models are pretty good at like generalizing on like different tasks, and they're just well suited for more kind of like a general pur purpose tasks, but it's not the best for your own data or like your specific use case. To achieve higher accuracy, we are going to train our own and fine tune our LLMs for our own data. And also as the world of like, software is just changing very rapidly, we want to keep up with all these changes. So we have to kind of like update the knowledge of our LLMs. That's the other reason that we think that we should train and just have like a control over the, like this whole training and self-hosting. And third is the content control. Basically, we are going to be in charge of the data and we have like a full control so we can avoid any unwanted content or it's just going to include anything that is licensed and ethically okay licensed specifically for code 
we want to make sure that we have like a data that is just going to follow all the privacy rules and we're just going to have like a fewer risks. And for sure, integrating this generative AI to our product it comes with challenges and some consideration that we should address. There are so many of those, but I'm just going to talk about a few of that that we think that these are like more important here at Harness. The first, we think that like still we should keep like human in the loop. All of these models, like ML models or AI, are great at like, enhancing the efficiency or accuracy, but still they can make mistakes. They can misinterpret data, they can hallucinate, and like, that's why we should keep human in the loop. Human can bring like, intuition, context, and ethic, and that's why all the critical like, decisions still should have like, a human judgment behind it. And then the bias in training data, all of this ML model are just only as good as the data that they've been trained on. If there is some like biases, even like a subtle bias in a training data set, they're just going to adopt it and it can have like a severe consequences. So as if we're just seeing this a, like ethical AI development, we have to inspect the training data, check it and make sure there isn't any of this kind of like a bias. And if there is any, we should take like a proper steps to mitigate it. And also, like as role of AI is growing in our society, so is the scrutiny under the use cases. Still, the government and institution they're working on defining different rules and regulations for AI. And so, for us as like AI developers or AI practitioner. Being compliant with this like whole like technology means staying up to date with all this like fast evolving regulations, understanding implications, and being agile enough to adapt to them. Also, we think that like many other tools, AI can be used both for good and bad. There's been this like growing concern of using like, kind of like a malicious use case of AI for different fields like the automated hacks. So we have to pay attention to all of those and safeguard against it and make sure that AI is only going to serve the society in a positive way. The last but not the least is ensuring privacy. And with like a bigger data it comes like a bigger responsibility and all these models they've been trained on this like very big data set. So we have to pay attention to the privacy and also be ready to kind of like adopt all the best practices in, pro in processing the data, storing it and handling it and also be transparent to the end user how we are using their data. Yeah, and with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Alex, He's going to demo how we've been infusing the whole AI to software delivery. Thank you. Oh, I should I'll go down. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Who's ready for AI demos? <laughs> Sweet. Let me get my screen up here. We'll switch. Oh, it's right there. Perfect. So today I'm going to demo seven different use cases in, infused with ADA. We're going to start with SCM, one of the exciting new announcements from the keynote. And then we're going to get into the entire software delivery lifecycle, from build to deploy to governance. Every step of the way, we're going to try and infuse AI, and we're going to demo that today. Someone in Harness heard that I used to write web pages back in the 90s. If you want a Perl script to order a pizza, you know, I'm your guy. And I've been presented with this repo. And now I need to go in and make some changes. So I need to find out where the web pages are being rendered. But how do I do that? I can go here and start searching for text and you know, get really complex. But instead, I can just say, where is index.html rendered? Just bear with me for a second. My typing's not the best. So instantly, Gitness will tell me exactly the web page rendering line of code where I can get productive very quickly. So this use case is really about developer onboarding. A lot of times you're asked to work on code that you've never actually had any familiarity with, or 
you've actually written code many years ago that you forgot about and you're trying to get familiar with again. So the idea of being able to search very intuitively when you're trying to on-ramp and get onboarded very quickly is key. But a lot of times people want to look at code when there's an incident. Like let's say for example there's a network incident and now we're trying to triage that incident and look at source code. I can just go here and do a query. And in this case, I'll look for where is the function for parsing the request line string. And this will take me right to the actual class that's operationalizing this particular piece of code. So the idea with the code search is to make it easy for people to get productive quickly, which is obviously a, you know, a key foundational part of the Harness platform. This is on the SCM side of things, but when we get to build, that's also where Ada can shine as well. So here we have a pretty simplistic CI pipeline. We have uh, you know, a build and a push. We also have a bandit security scan here. But we can see over here on the left right hand side that exit status one is the error. So as a developer, what I would do then is start to go and look at the actual console view here and dig through all these logs. And we've heard from our platform engineering teams, like a lot of times they get tickets and requests to look at logs uh, because the developer doesn't actually know what's going on. And so with Ida, I can go in right here and just ask. So this will take a look at all the results of the pipeline and give me a few possible remediation techniques. And we go from exit status one to it's this line of Java code where I'm a horrible Java developer and I forgot a semicolon. So all I need to do is a one line code change and then my pipeline will be up and running. So these are the type of remediation you know, workflows we can do powered by IAI. So that's one example with build. We also see the bandit scan here. So we've talked a little bit about Harness STO and the ability to take security exceptions, both SAS and DAS scanners, IAC, and then normalize it and show the results in a very developer-friendly way. So here we're seeing an example where I have hard-coded SQL expressions. And so as part of IDA, we have the ability to have remediation steps that are generated dynamically. This is also something where a lot of times when we show the idea of uh, AI generated remediation and code, it can get a little, you know, people get a little uncomfortable. So if you want to, this is also completely governed by role based access control. So you can have teams that can leverage this technology and then also teams that maybe you have concerns around governance. Um, so that's there as well. So in this particular case, I can see the remediation step. I can take this, put it into my source code and make it very easy to have compliant code very quickly. So that's on the SDO front. Obviously, the granddaddy of harness capability is continuous delivery. We have many continuous delivery customers here today. And people always talk about this idea of kind of like a full stack engineer. But it's not really you know, true. You may have some level of knowledge in you know, DevOps and Kubernetes, but everyone can't know everything. And so a lot of times what we see when we provide self-service pipelines is developers struggle with various exceptions and error messages that will pop up during continuous delivery. So again, similar to CI, we can go in and see what's going on powered by AI. So here if we go and we see you know, this particular error message, it's a timeout. A timeout in a pipeline could be a million different things. Right? And I can go in here and look in the logs and try and figure out what's going on. Or I can just click this. So this will take a summary of all the logs that are presented in this particular pipeline. And then I can go in and see that, hey, this is, this is actually like the number one CD onboarding issue. Someone has the wrong image and the wrong tag in a pipeline. So the ability to just present that right up front makes it really easy for people to get going and have a successful pipeline, pipeline run sooner. So that's CD. There's a lot of other capability in the Harness platform as we've you know, detailed during the keynote today. In feature flags, and I'm not gonna demo this in depth today, but we'll look at your source code and essentially we'll onboard the, the flag configuration and the SDK version into your code, allowing you to onboard very quickly without having to make manual code changes. 
So we're using AI to also help enable onboarding in a seamless fashion. Once you've had a you know, build and deploy, and you're up and running, and maybe you have feature management installed, a lot of our customers are looking at resiliency checks. And Harness has chaos engineering built into the platform powered by Litmus Chaos. And one of the exciting new features here is Chaos Guard. As companies go from leveraging chaos in like pre-production environments to production, there needs to be standards in place to make sure that there's no incidents that can occur with you know, misconfigurations or errant chaos tests. And so we have the ability to build policies around that to block certain tests. So I've been asked to prevent network checks from being run during production hours. So I can go into Chaos Guard and say block network checks. Click Save. And now we have a, you know, a YAML editor. And so now, historically, what I'd have to do is go look at the documentation, learn another YAML spec, which nobody wants to, and then kind of misconfigure it, reconfigure it, get it working right. But now I can just have it generated automatically and say, hey, I want to block all network faults in the infrastructure and apply this to my configuration, ensuring that we have no network-related faults running during business hours. So that, that's just another example of how you can introduce AI to build out the entire content delivery and at least give you 90% of what you need, and then you can tweak as needed from there. So that's a resiliency check. Harness dashboards really show the entire picture, right? So building out Dora, building out you know, different metrics so teams can look and have a scorecard as to who's performing well, who's performing poorly. And this is based on Looker. And Looker is extremely robust. It allows you to customize it in a variety of ways. You can build in custom metrics. You can really have someone that's dedicated to building out Looker dashboards. Now, there's ways to edit this pretty easily and go in and add widgets and stuff like that. But there is a learning curve. So now we have the ability to build out widgets dynamically. So I can go in here and click Create a Widget. And I can pick what I want. So in this case, I'll look at Builds and Repositories, select a single value. And then I can go ahead and say, like, what's my deployment success rate? And now this will be generated and placed automatically into the dashboard. And that's a very basic example. But if I want to. There we go. So this is pretty complex, but you can easily generate automated widgets without having to know anything about Looker. And once you have visibility in place, a lot of times the next phase in the life cycle of software delivery is ensuring compliance. And so as part of that, we have Open Policy Agent. And anyone who's talked to me knows I can talk your ear off about Open Policy Agent for a long time. I feel it's a, it's a very exciting feature. And the nice thing about it is it's a platform feature. So if you have one capability of the platform, you can leverage Open Policy Agent in your environments. And it really allows platform engineering teams to stop being the pipeline police and allow for federated environments and people can adopt um, pipelines and be able to customize pipelines that even touch production because the, the path to production is code. So OPA is amazing, it's very popular, it's, it's very complex too. I mean, if you look at a particular policy, like writing Rego, which is the language OPA is based on, it is not a trivial task. And so instead of being a Rego expert, I can actually go ahead and build policies with Ida, and then also I can click Learn. So if I just want to learn what a policy is actually doing underneath the covers, it will explain the policy for me. But what I want to do is just go ahead and build out a policy set with some basic kind of features here. So I'm going to give this a name of uh, Block SU. I'm an old Linux admin. And a lot of times, you don't want people writing, running code as a privileged user. Um, so I'm going to go in here and just say, block the SU command. Give me one second. I'll use this one here. So 
let me reload. One second. Live demos. New policy. SU. There we go. And then I can use Ida right there. Well, I think it's probably I've been zoomed in too much, but essentially it will generate the policy dynamically um, from this. So this is something that's very exciting. You can explain and generate policies, uh, which has been probably our number one request in terms of making OPA more user friendly. Um, and in speaking of user friendliness, the last thing I want to show here is the chatbot. So we have great documentation. We have very robust docs. Uh, we use docs as code, so it allows uh, customers and you know, Harness employees to make code changes and provide pull requests. But really, DevOps engineers never look at documentation. Uh, they usually just go ahead and run things. And then when it breaks, then they look at the docs. And so the idea is let's have documentation integrated into the platform. And so now I have Harness support built directly in here. So to give an example, a lot of our CD customers would know. I can go in here and just say, how do I install a Kubernetes delegate? If I can spell delegate right. And this will go ahead and query our documentation and come back with a meaningful answer immediately. So I can see here, you have three different ways you can install the delegate. I can use it using a Helm chart. Um, and then also a Kubernetes manifest. And then also Terraform. So all the answers are right in here, and it's across the entire platform. So we demonstrated seven different ways that we can incorporate AI into the platform across code, across build, STO, CD, feature flags, dashboards, chaos, governance as well. But it's really only the beginning, as Harish has talked about. So with that, that concludes the demo. But thank you for your time.